pleasure to be here tonight. And uh, just, just to make a slight correction, actually, at first I was Jewish, then I was a Jew for Jesus, and I'm back to Jews for Judaism. So some people sometimes wonder if I was born Jewish. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, okay. I, my, my parents uh, are survivors of the Holocaust. Um, my father lost everyone um, in the Holocaust. My mother lost everyone but uh, a sister. And um, <coughs> we were raised in a very traditional family. And so uh, uh, my, my, many Holocaust survivors, like uh, my parents, uh, had uh, a traditional uh, perspective on Judaism, but uh, we're not really very religious, and this is the type of Judaism I was brought up in. Um, what I want to do uh, tonight is talk to you about the problem uh, of evangelical Christian missionaries that are targeting Jews for conversion. Um, we might call it the battle for the Jewish soul, the evangelical Christian threat to our Jewish community. And as I share with you tonight uh, my overview of this problem, and it's a growing problem, um, I want you to appreciate that my perspective is not from somebody who has made it his hobby to study these issues. I, I'm, I, I didn't go to university to study the topic. I would say that in much the same way as uh, my parents were the victim of physical persecution in the Holocaust, maybe you could say that I was the victim of spiritual persecution. And so, as a survivor of my experience, I want to share with you what I've been through and to try and share with you the, um, the scope and the danger that we as a Jewish community face. I want to discuss a few issues tonight. Number one, I'm going, to make, I'm going to be making the mention of missionaries many times tonight. Who are the missionaries? We use the term very loosely. I want to describe who the missionaries are. Address the issue of the obsession to convert Jews. Is there an obsession to get Jews to convert to Christianity? And to show how the past techniques have changed and the techniques that missionaries are using today to achieve incredible results in converting Jews to the Christian faith. When, uh, when the uh, program is over, I'll, uh, after I've said what I've had to say, I have a video that we could show a few minutes of to give you a visual demonstration. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And you see, when you see some of these images in video, it, you go, wow, this, this is really something that we have to deal with. But before I start, I always like to put everything in context. So I'll, I'll tell a little story of Mr. Feldman. Uh, the context in terms of how we as a Jewish community, how we as a Jewish people feel about the issue of Christianity, Jesus, etc. So there's this Mr. Feldman. Mr. Feldman is an old man who lives in Brooklyn, probably 87, 88 years old. He's had a very nice life, but he decides he wants to have a holiday of a lifetime. As he gets older, he's getting frail and it's difficult for him to move around. He wants to have a holiday. He's always wanted, you know, they, they, they came up with a, a movie a number of years ago called The Bucket List. It's a movie about what you want to do before you kick the bucket. So for Mr. Feldman, he wants to go on a skiing holiday before he kicks the bucket. So he books into a kosher ski resort in Grudewald, Switzerland, and takes some ski lessons, and spends the week going down the mountains, and the shushing, and the moguls, and the parallel ski, and the, whatever he did, he had a beautiful time. Then it comes, it's Friday afternoon, he's going down the hill, and then he realizes, oh my gosh, Shabbos is coming. He sees the sun setting down, setting in the, in, the, in the distance, and he realizes he has to rush. So he's skiing down the hills really quick because he has to get back to the chalet before Shabbos, and he falls. Okay, that's terrible. They, they checked him into the local Catholic hospital where all the uh, nurses are nuns. And there he recovers over the weekend, and comes on Sunday, he's on crutches and he's hobbling out of the hospital, barely able to walk, but he's got a big cast. But before he can leave the hospital, the chief, chief nurse, Sister Frances, says to him, Mr. Feldman, you know you can't leave so quickly. We have to clear up the accounting. You must pay your bill. At this, Mr. Feldman says, well, I'm terribly sorry. I haven't got any money. 
I spent all my money to come on this wonderful holiday and I can't pay your bill. At this, Sister Frances says, well, surely you must have a relative somewhere who could pay the bill. And he said, well, my only relative is my sister. But she's an old maid who converted to Catholicism and became a nun like you. At this, Sister Frances says, Mr. Feldman, I'll have you know that we nuns are not old maids. We are married to Jesus Christ. <laughs> At this, Mr. Feldman says, well, if that's the case, send the bill to my brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> it puts it in perspective. He knows the bill will never get paid. Anyways, a little, a little, you know, the truth of the matter is the topic we're speaking about tonight is so serious and so bleak that it's very rare that we find opportunities to have a little laugh. That might be the only time. But let's get into business here. It has been said in the media that more Jews have converted to Christianity in the last 20 years than in the last 20 centuries. That is an incredibly large statistic. How could this be? What has happened? Traditionally, when we talk about who missionaries are, it was the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, Church was the game in town for 1,500 years, and whether it was through uh, the Inquisitions, Crusades, pogroms, what have you, it was the Catholic Church that was the predominant game in town when it came to promoting Christianity until the invention of the printing press in the 1500s, when Gutenberg's first major production was printing the Bible. And when he printed the Bible, there was an, an interesting protest that happened amongst many Christians. The protest was that, hey, wait a minute, the Bible that the Roman Catholic Church has been preaching for these last 1500 years doesn't say what we read. And they protested against the Roman Catholic Church and thus the Protestant movement was born. And within the Protestant movement, a different approach to promoting Christianity developed. And so what we have now in the world are two major Christian churches, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And it is within the Protestant Church that we are going to find that source of um, um, interest in converting Jews to Christianity. Within the Protestant Church, there really are two sides. There's the more liberal, um, uh, church that we could use uh, the example here in Canada, of the United Church of Canada. In this particular case, these churches may not take the Bible too literally. They may not be that uh, devout in their spirituality and their belief in God. Uh, they may have more liberal approaches towards uh, uh, gay marriage and abortion, etc. But on the right side of the Protestant world is the evangelical, born-again, fundamentalist uh, Christian church. These are Christians that believe in God 100%. They read their Bible every day. They go to church many times a week, at least on Sunday once or twice. They sometimes go for Bible studies. They pray fervently. Um, they, they believe in um, uh, supporting traditional roles in marriage. They are anti-abortion, etc. Um, and one of the things they believe in also is, is because the Bible teaches that God gave the um, nation of Israel to the Jewish people. Many of them are very supportive of Israel, very pro-Israel. We know that today when we uh, pay attention to the media, Israel can claim that probably its only true friends are those nations that are being led by evangelical fundamentalist Christians. Um, today we know that Canada probably shares the pinnacle, uh, share, doesn't share, it, ha it holds the pinnacle of uh, appreciation from Israel. It's probably the most uh, friendly country to Israel, and it's probably got something to do with Stephen Harper's evangelical Christian faith. What we have are evangelical Christians who also are very, very much seriously committed to promoting their religion and fulfilling their New Testament scriptural mandate, which comes from the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What am I saying? 
I'm saying that the New Testament has a passage that says if you believe in Jesus, you go to hell. I mean, if you believe in Jesus, you go to heaven. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. That's basically it. And evangelical Christians make a serious effort to try and do what they can to try and share their faith. And we're not talking about a small little minority. In America, statistics indicate that a third of Americans identify as evangelical Christians. A third of Americans read their Bible every day and are committed to sharing their faith in some sort of way. This is a large number of individuals who share the belief that it's important that all individuals believe in Jesus. My personal opinion is that any individual Christian who takes their religion seriously, who believes that they have to share their faith with me and let me and tell me that I have to believe in Jesus or I'm going to go to hell, that person's a missionary. And so my perspective is, loosely, this one-third of America can be considered as a missionary threat to the Jewish community. But I'll be a little bit more strict on that. Let's focus a little bit more on the formal missionaries, those people who actually make it their job to convert Jews to Christianity. There are a lot of missionary organizations that do that. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, why target the Jews? Why us? You know, a lot of times when people find out about the work that we do with Jews for Judaism, which is predominantly countering the missionary threat, they say, why don't they just pick on somebody else for a change? Why don't they go target the non-Jews? Why pick on the Jews? And so in order for you to appreciate why Jews are a specific target in the uh, sites of these evangelical missionaries, you have to take a moment to appreciate the um, roots of their faith. You know, we've probably never heard of groups called Buddhists for Jesus, or Hindus for Jesus, or Northern, Iroquois, Northern Ontario Iroquois Indians for Jesus, but there probably isn't a Jewish person alive today who hasn't heard of the group Jews for Jesus. Everyone's heard of this group. Who are they? They are a missionary organization dedicated to the conversion of Jews to the Protestant Evangelical Christian faith. Why? Why specifically target us? You have to appreciate the essence of their faith lies in the root word of the word Christianity. The root word is Christ. Many people mistakenly think that Christ is Jesus' last name, like Jesus, Jesus Schwartz or Jesus Rosenberg. But Christ is a title. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which is a Greek translation from the Hebrew word Mashiach. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit warm. Not crucifixion? No. No, it comes from the word Mashiach. Christos is the Greek translation of Mashiach. And well, let's hold questions to the end, by the way, so this way I won't get distracted. The Hebrew word Mashiach, many people, when I ask what does it mean, most people say Messiah, but that's not what Mashiach means. The Hebrew word Mashiach means an anointed one. And it comes from the Hebrew word limshoach. To give you a little bit of context of what it means, um, in the Jewish Bible, there are a number of individuals who are anointed with oil. And when these individuals are anointed with oil, the adjective Mashiach can be used to, uh, and be applied to that individual. For instance, the Kohanim, the high priest, the coin of the priest in the temple, when they were inaugurated into the service of the Almighty, would have oil poured on their head, and this individual could be called a Mashiach. The prophets um, also had oil poured on their heads. They could be referred to as Mashiach. The kings of Israel, a king, when a king was initiated into the service of the Almighty, would have oil poured on his head, and we could refer to that king as a Mashiach, there was the Mashiach, God's anointed. And in fact, there are times in the, in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible, when um, the kings are referred to as God's anointed, as a Mashiach. One thing is clear, though, is that the concept of the Mashiach 
going 2,000 years ago, was uniquely and solely a Jewish concept. No other people on earth had the concept of the Mashiach. No other place on earth could you go to and talk about a Messiah and they would know what you were talking about. If you went to China, you went to Africa, if you went to South America and said the Mashiach has come, nobody would know what you were talking about. It is only the Jews who had the concept of the Messiah. It's only the Jews who prayed three times a day for the coming of the Messiah. The Jews had the prayers of the Messiah in our Birchot Amazon, in our, our prayers at the end of our meal. And at the time of the Roman persecution, we were probably more ready for a Mashiach than at any time in our history because of the incredible persecution that we suffered under the hands of the Romans. So if all these missionaries are actively trying to convert Jews to Christianity, one of the things that they often want us to believe is that they have something that we need. In much the same way as if uh, somebody found the cure to cancer, they would probably rush to tell the authorities that they have found the cure to solve the problem Missionaries feel that for the Jewish people, they have found the cure for our spiritual demise, and that is in Jesus. They believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. They believe that Jews should have no problem in embracing Jesus as the Messiah because, according to them, he fulfilled everything that the Mashiach was supposed to, call, supposed to do. Let's stop for a minute and just ask ourselves if that's the case. What was the Mashiach, what is the Mashiach supposed to accomplish in simple terms? And did Jesus accomplish this? First of all, we know that the Mashiach must be Jewish. He must be from the tribe of Judah and a descendant of King David and King Solomon. That when the Mashiach comes, all the Jews in the world will be living back in the land of Israel and will be keeping Torah. When the Mashiach comes, the entire world will believe in our God, the God, of, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The temple will be rebuilt, and the world will experience peace like we've never known before. There will be a permanent end to war. We know that when all these things have happened, and there is an individual sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, it won't be something that we'll have to say we believe in. It'll be front page news. It'll be on the front page of the National Post, the New York Times, the Jerusalem Post. It won't be a matter of something that, has to, that, that somebody has to uh, have an article of faith to, t to testify they believe that such and such an individual is the Messiah. You'd have to be crazy not to know it. Also, it's isn't it? That's a different issue. But please, let's keep the questions to the end. The question is, in appreciating the Christian perspective on their obsession to convert the Jews, their focus is that they thoroughly believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So much so that the New Testament makes no bones about it. In the New Testament, there's a passage in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16, where the Apostle Paul, who was the author of the New Testament, says that, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And this pecking order, this priority that is placed on converting Jews in the New Testament is something that is repeated many times in the New Testament. And when the New Testament has a precedent placed that Jews have to come first, we have a dilemma for that 80 million American evangelical Christians who want to be good Christians, who want to do what they can to fulfill God's will in being the best Christian possible. So what do they do in terms of fulfilling this mandate that is brought out in the New Testament to bring the gospel to the Jew first? Sadly, maybe it's a good thing, Many of them don't know any Jews, so they can't do anything about it.
but they have missionary groups that come and say that vicariously they can come on their behalf and if these evangelical Christians will support these missionary groups, they can do the work for them. I'm going to get back to these missionary groups momentarily to show you how effective they are in trying to mobilize these 80 million American Christians, this one-third of the American Christian po American population. The New Testament, as I, I mentioned, has a way of pressing the individual Christian, motivating them to convert Jews to Christianity, but we have another dilemma in Christianity. The dilemma is that Jesus fulfilled nothing that the Messiah was supposed to accomplish. Nothing. And we're not ashamed to say that. It's why we as a Jewish people don't believe in it. Because he wasn't the Mashiach. I just outlined four major criteria by which we would identify who the Mashiach is. We saw that all the Jews would be living back in the land of Israel, and it is true that lately in the last few decades, many, many Jews have moved to Israel, but all the Jews don't live in the land of Israel. We are still living in the exile. We are told that the entire world will believe, and, these, and this, this is just not tradition, these are based on many, many Bible passages that are in our scriptures. Uh, we have pamphlets here tonight that you could take home with you to verify some of these passages. And for those people who are watching this lecture on YouTube, you can go to our YouTube channel and see many of our videos that go through step by step all the criteria by which we will recognize the Messiah and the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, clearly expands on all those issues. But all the Jews are not living in the land of Israel. All the world does not believe in our God. The temple has not been rebuilt. In fact, the temple was standing in the time of Jesus. It was destroyed 38 years after his execution. And there's no world peace. There hasn't been world peace since the death of Jesus. And the reality is you could attribute many of the wars that were fought historically since the time of Jesus were fought in his name. So for Christian missionaries try to implore that Jesus is the Messiah, Jews have no problem saying, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. The Christians aren't too troubled by that. They say, actually, you Jews are wrong. Because Jesus came already as the Mashiach for a different reason, to die for our sins, to atone for our sins. And you will see that when he comes the second time, then everything you expect the Mashiach to accomplish will be accomplished, and then you'll see. It's a very nice theory, the second coming, but has no foundation in Judaism. And is just that a theory on the part of Christian missionaries to try and account for the dismal failure of Jesus accomplishing nothing that the Mashiach was supposed to accomplish. But to that end, in the hope of Jesus' second coming, evangelical Christian missionaries await his return. Because you see, they're shortchanged at this stage of the game. They don't have all the benefits of their faith that they are guaranteed with Jesus' return. And the New Testament talks about his return in a number of ways. In one particular case, in the uh, Greek Testament, Jesus is asked, when are you going to come back? And Jesus says to the people who are asking him, I will only come back, it says here, you will not see me until you say, and see when he says to you, he's referring to the Jewish people, you will not see me until you, the Jews, say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, or until you recognize me as the Messiah. And this is a motivational passage for many of these missionaries to try and hasten the second coming of Jesus, to bring it on as quickly as possible, so that that way when the Jewish people are converted to Christianity, then they can be assured that Jesus' imminent second coming will be at hand. And you have to appreciate, um, I mentioned earlier on that we are, uh, as a Jewish people, in terms of Israel, uh, very appreciative of the support that we get from nations that have strong uh, evangelical reasons for supporting Israel, that being the Bible. They believe in our Bible, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh. That Bible says that the land of Israel does belong to the Jews. And these evangelical Christians who 
are extremely devout and, and fervent and in their belief that the Bible is the Word of God, use that as their strength and their reason and their conviction to stand behind Israel. But it is those same evangelical Christians who believe that the New Testament says that you have to bring the gospel to the Jew first. And so as a result, those very same Christians, I believe most of them, that support the nation of Israel are also supporting evangelical missionary groups that are trying to target Jews to conversion. In addition to this passage I, meant, I mentioned here, there's another passage that says that in the end times there will be 144,000 Jews who will become, I use the word, latter-day Billy Grahams. There will be 144,000 they call uh, prophets or missionaries to the Jews in Israel. And they go far, so far as to say it will be 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes trying to convert us to Christianity. There's another passage in the New Testament that they cite as one that motivates them to try and see and hasten Jews converting to Christianity. Clearly we have a theological obsession that is based on passages in the New Testament, but there's also a psychological obsession on the part of these Christians. See, if you can appreciate the dilemma that many sincere, um, strong believing Christians uh, are in, in terms of their conviction that Jesus has to be the Messiah, they are faced with a terrible dilemma when it comes to the Jews. We were the world's authority on who the Mashiach, we are the world's authority on who the Mashiach is and should be. 2,000 years ago that authority was no different. <coughs> Yet, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came, without batting an eyelash, the Jews said, no, he's not the Mashiach, and we did not accept him. For Christians, this really creates an awful dilemma for them, because if Jews were the world's authority on the Mashiach, if Jews, David, prayed three times a day for the Mashiach, if so much of part of Jewish culture and belief is in the coming of the Mashiach, then why did the Jews not accept him? And so the one question that comes up is, maybe the Jews were right. That's a terrible thing for a Christian. The Jews are right, and Jesus is not the Messiah. That's horrible. How could that be? But you see, the Jewish people are such a smart people that maybe they can be right. You know, we have, as a Jewish people, so many uh, attributes that have been applied to us over the years. Some accusing us of being diabolical when we take a look at, for instance, um, uh, the, the Black Plague, the bubonic plague in Europe. They blamed on the Jews that we somehow had this ability to mastermind the Black Plague. Um, the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a book that was a fable, written as a fiction, but has become to be accepted as the truth that the Jews have a plot to overtake the world, that we are so insidiously brilliant that we are able to mastermind and take over of the world. We are told that we are very intelligent. Most people who are um, aware of Jewish individuals appreciate that many Jewish people are intelligent. We're doctors, we're lawyers, we are um, 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 very well represented in the list of uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners. We have this reputation of being extremely smart. And so if we are so smart, then why didn't we accept Jesus unless maybe we were right? And so this really motivates, I feel, Christians to try and convert a Jew to accept Jesus. If they can convert one Jew and get that individual to, to come to their Baptist church in Buttonville, then maybe it'll, it'll be a, a, a confirmation for them that, ah, we have a Jew who's converted to Christianity, Jesus must be the Jewish Messiah. But 
They have failed dismally, dismally over the last 2,000 years in trying to convert us. Try as they may, they never really succeeded in converting any large numbers. And if you uh, take a look at the response that we as a Jewish people would have had to the presentation of Christianity, you would understand and appreciate, first of all, how we had no problem rejecting it, but in presenting these three obstacles to Christianity that missionaries couldn't overcome, I want to suggest how missionaries today have changed the playing field. If I could present to you three obstacles that missionaries couldn't overcome, I'd say obstacle number one is that we as a Jewish people always had a strong sense of our Jewish identity. We always had a very positive feeling of who we were as a people. We liked who we were. We liked maybe living in our towns, in our Jewish shtetl. Maybe we liked living near our Jewish cultural center. If we were religious, we liked living near the synagogue. We liked the, and the reality is, because of so much anti-Semitism and persecution, we had no choice but to live among Jewish people. Maybe we just liked our Barbra Streisand records. Whatever the reason was, we liked being Jewish, and when a missionary tried to convert a Jew to Christianity, the reality was, the perception was, that to become a, pr a Christian would mean that we would have to leave our Jewish community, go to this Gentile world, where we would be associating with non-Jews, going to a Christian church that met on Sundays with a big cross, we'd be eating food that wasn't Jewish, <coughs> everything about the new life that we would uh, supposedly embrace if we got involved in Christianity would be totally devoid of anything Jewish. And the reality is there were customs among some in, in the Jewish world that when somebody did convert to Christianity, sometimes people sat shiva for these individuals and uh, considered them dead. The issue of Jewish identity is one that missionaries couldn't overcome, and for no other reason other than Jews like being Jewish, missionaries could not conquer that particular obstacle. Obstacle number two was the Jewish Bible. We have been known for 2,000 years to be the people of the book. The book is the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh. We knew our Bible inside and out, backwards and forwards, in the original Hebrew language, and in many cases in the languages of the peoples in which we lived. For a missionary to try and suggest to a Jewish person that the Bible had prophecies that proved that Jesus was the Messiah was preposterous. And most Jewish people knew their Bible, knew enough that missionaries had a dismal, dismal rate of success in trying to convert Jews by using our Bible. And so the Bible really was not something that they could use to try and convince us. And lastly was our sense of Jewish spirituality. Our love of Judaism, of Jewish life, of our personal relationship with the Almighty. When a missionary tried to impose on a Jewish person the suggestion that they did not have a personal relationship with God and that to have it they had to accept Jesus in their heart and as their eternal sacrifice, Jews would say that's Bashika. It makes no sense to me. I already have a relationship with God. I pray every day. It's part of my life. I have Jewish holidays. I have Jewish... Jewish spirituality and our personal relationship with God was something that was part and parcel of Jewish life for the last... Uh, since the inception of Christianity and since the giving of the Torah. So the missionaries could not overcome that. But all that's changed. They've developed a technology today that... One, takes advantage of a very, very serious uh, problem that we are having with the Jewish community of Jews assimilating and being disenfranchised with Judaism, of Jews being disassociated with anything spiritual. They are taking advantage of a situation where Jewish people don't know why they should even be Jewish. But they feel guilty about converting to another religion. There's this guilt. They feel, you know, I'm Jewish. I was born a Jew. I'm going to die. Jews, Jews feel guilty about accepting something else. And so what has happened is missionaries have taken advantage 
of repackaging. You know, they call rebranding. Sometimes you can take an old product and just rebrand it and all of a sudden, bingo, it's new again. When it comes to Jewish identity, there is, uh, you know, I'm going to stop. I'll tell my story. My story basically describes what they're doing. And I will take those three obstacles and show how the missionaries overcame my resistance to becoming a Christian. I mentioned earlier on, I had a traditional upbringing brought up by Holocaust survivors. And uh, my parents, because they had very, very limited um, understanding of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism, sent me to a cheder, to an afternoon school. I would go to school from 9 till 3.30, get on the streetcar, and go to my cheder from 4 till 6. Did this five days a week, Monday through Thursday, and on Sunday mornings. Did that for six years, had my bar mitzvah, and as with many of my peers, once the bar mitzvah was finished, oh, we're finished with Hebrew school, we don't have to bother with that anymore. And we didn't. My experience in going to synagogue was primarily as a child and, and, and preparing for bar mitzvah. But by the time the bar mitzvah was finished, as with many of my peers, there was no involvement whatsoever with synagogue life. And as a teenager, although I did affiliate somewhat with uh, Jewish teens, by the time I got to college, um, I went here in Toronto to the Ontario College of Art and Design. Um, and by the time I got there, there were very, very few Jewish individuals that I was associating with. My world was basically that of, of, of non-Jews. And it was in the context of um, being at the Ontario College of Art that my life changed. The program there is four years, and the last, the last of the four years upon graduation, I was very successful as a student there. They had then, what they still have now, a weekend where they put on display the best work of the students in that school. And um, I had a, a large wall with a lot of my artwork on display. Oh, I have a, sam a sample here actually, right? Well, I'll show it later on. I had a large uh, sample of my art, artwork, large display of, of samples of my artwork on display for people to come and, and take a look and see what I'm doing in hopes of maybe being discovered by an art director or maybe a publishing company. My strength was illustration and graphic design. But uh, I didn't have a lot, of, uh, a lot of success over that weekend. I was stood by my display Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The display was uh, closing up at uh, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock that afternoon on the Sunday. Along comes Mary Beth. Mary Beth was the beauty, beauty queen of the school. She was extremely, extremely attractive. Tall, pretty, funny, talkative. Um, anything a guy could dream of possibly having as a girlfriend, that, that was it. My problem is I was not what you'd call a, 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 a uh, very experienced individual with dating, and I was not that attractive, maybe 150 pounds skinnier than I am now, a lot of acne on my face, big black glasses. Anyways, I never said a word to her during the entire four years because I was very shy, and I wouldn't know what I would say to such a beautiful girl. But she came up to my display and started talking to me, and right away my, my palms broke out into a sweat, my tongue got dry, I couldn't say anything. But eventually she, being the friendly individual she was, started asking me questions about my artwork, and boy, that hour went really quickly, and by the time it was over, the college was saying, well, Julie, she's got to wrap up now, and I, I had to take down my display. I said, but uh, I was having a very nice conversation with her, I said, would you like to go out? I can't believe I did that. She said, yes. I can't believe she said that. So, we had a date. I packed up my display. The next Saturday night we went on our date and it was wonderful. I couldn't believe the girl of my dreams. I just, without going into details, I, I, I thought this is fantastic. So much so that at the end of that first date, I quickly said, can we go again next Saturday night? She said, sure. Well, I did on the second date what I would not recommend guys do on a second date. Once the, uh, we get together, we 
can't remember where we went, what we were doing, but I, I, I didn't hesitate to tell her that I loved her. You don't do that on the second date. But she said to me, Julius, cool your jets. I'm in love with somebody else. I went, what? How can you be in love with somebody else? I mean, you're going out with me and you're in love with somebody else? Who is this guy? I'll scratch his eyes out. I was so upset, like, how, you, know, you know, here you, you, you just feel like you're finally finding the love of your life and she's got another boyfriend? How could you do this? Who is he? And she said, Jesus Christ. And I went, thank God, I thought you had a serious boyfriend. <laughs> but she was serious. What happened was, this was an evangelical Christian girl who, for whatever reason, was not feeling too committed to her faith at that time and one of the things evangelical Christians are supposed to do is only go out with other evangelical Christians, other believers, and not to go out with somebody who's not a believer. So she thought she would put God first on this date and straighten up the mess she made. She had backslidden. And so she thought she would tell me about Jesus and put that on the front of the agenda so that she would know that he came first. And I thought, this is not a problem, I can handle that. But in no short time, I was going to her church, she was taking me to her Bible studies. I was going to her Christian socials, meeting all her friends. And quite honestly, I was enjoying them and having a very nice time. It was, it was uh, interesting learning about the Bible, the New Testament. I felt a little bit guilty, but she would be giving me pamphlets about, um, uh, about believing in Jesus. Many of these pamphlets written by other Jews who had converted to Christianity. And in time, I was beginning to like be won over but one Sunday afternoon, I went to her church, and the minister in that church said some things that really rubbed me the wrong way, almost smacked of anti-Semitism, and it, 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 just, it just didn't make me feel good about being there at all. And I remember after I walked out to her, uh, from, her um, from her church, I said to her, you know, Mary Beth, that's it, I, I, I can't come back here anymore. I was born a Jew, I'm going to die a Jew, this is not Jewish. You know, this is Christianity, and, and I, just, I, just can't, I just can't continue. There's, there's something not right here. So it was a terrible thing because it, with our relationship was this whole spiritual struggle, and it was not a good thing that this was beginning to fall apart. So in her attempt to try and find some way for me to hear her Christian gospel message, she found out about a new congregation that started up here in Toronto, a Messianic synagogue, and... Um, told me about it, said they meet on Friday night, and uh, gave me the phone number of the contact there to speak to, to get the information as to where to go, and maybe I'd be interested in going. So, I went to uh, this uh, congregation. Uh, they have, um, uh, uh, it was at that time they were renting space in a public library, and when I, but they had well outfitted when I went in there, it's called Congregation Melech Israel, Congregation of the King of Israel. When I went there on a Friday night, I walked in, and uh, they had a lot of people. There must have been seating about 40 people in the, aud in the uh, auditorium at that time. It was a small room about this size. Up front was an Arna Kodesh, uh, two Israeli flags. Oh, sorry, one Israeli flag, one Canadian flag. Arna Kodesh, a big mug and dove that said Yeshua in the middle of it. Uh, pictures of Hasidim dancing all around, the pictures from the Kotel all around on the walls. It was um, um, a lot of music going on in, in the congregation. There was a, some guitars, uh, clarinets, tambourine, violin, beautiful music. And they were, the, the music was traditional Jewish melodies, Hinin Matov, Sisu et Yerushalayim, Od Yishema, really nice Jewish music. And um, it felt, it felt like amazing that this didn't feel like church at all. I, I knew that this was a, a congregation of Jews that believed in Jesus, but it seemed like, like a synagogue. And as I mentioned, the men were wearing, if I didn't mention, the men were kippahs and, and, and prayer shawls, and uh, it felt like I was in a little synagogue and I was enjoying it. I was not familiar with the melodies, but I, I clapped along. At some point, the music got really up-tempo, and some of the, the congregants got around and started dancing the hora. And after about 20, 30 minutes of this music, Things died down, and uh, one of the ladies from the congregation came up to the uh, front of the congregation where they had a little lectern like this with some Shabbat candles, 
and she was about to light the Shabbat candles, but they dimmed the lights, made it nice and low. Then everybody held hands, and together the entire congregation started singing. May the Lord protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining name. Ya da 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 da. May God bless you and grant you long lives. Where's that song from? Israel. And what scene is that from? They light the candles. Lighting the Shabbat candles. And who doesn't cry when you watch that scene in the movie? Mm -hmm. I've seen that movie ten times. Mm -hmm. I saw it on Broadway once. I saw it in England once, live on stage. And it breaks down everything inside you because there's Tevye with his daughters, a poor, downtrodden man, relishing in the beauty of Shabbat with his family. And it just now it makes me choke up thinking about who doesn't get choked up about this beautiful shtetl from Fiddler on the Roof. And here they create it in the middle of a church. And it was beautiful. May God bless you. And, you know, it was just tingling up the spine. They all sing the song. She finally lights the Shabbat candles. L'hadlik ne'er shel Shabbat. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of Jesus Christ. Then the Messianic rabbi comes forward. You're laughing, but this is real. The Messianic rabbi comes forward and he has his, his becher, his, his wine cup. Then they take the two chalas. Okay, you know, I, I, I didn't quite get the, what was going on because it was so Hebrew, it sounded pretty good, but you know what? It felt nice. Then the Messianic rabbi went ahead with his sermon. And in the sermon, no Christian terminology. The New Testament is called the Brit Hadasha. He refers to the Old Testament as the Tanakh. Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach. Mary is Miriam. Joseph is, is Yosef. You know, in, in, in terms of, of some of the, the new speak in these Messianic groups, Baptism was called the mikvah service. What I learned when I got involved, I started going to this congregation uh, frequently on Friday nights. It was really an interesting ritual. I go to my parents' house for Shabbat dinner and quickly get out of there by 7.30 so I get to my Messianic meeting for 8 o'clock. They asked me where was I going. I said, I'm going to shul. They were so happy. I, was, I didn't have the heart to tell them what I was doing. I was going to shul. And so I would go to these services on Friday night after going to my parents' house for Shabbat dinner and uh, eventually started going to their Bible studies and, and after that to some of their uh, retreats and their conferences. And over the course of a year, um, I basically was indoctrinated with a lot of their Christian theology. What was I a victim of? And in addition to what I just described to you, in my particular case, um, you know, I just described the little messianic synagogue experience, but these groups are using only Jewish symbols, Jewish terminology, um, and their pamphlets only display pictures of Torah scrolls, uh, pictures of the Kotel in, in Yerushalayim, um, stars of David, nothing about their, their presentation has anything to do with Christianity. You know, in times past, a missionary might be named Father McGillicuddy. He would be wearing a black shirt, a white collar, handing you a pamphlet with a figure on a cross with blood dripping down his hands. You knew what you were getting into. But here now, it's a Messianic rabbi with a kippah, a face as Jewish as the map of Israel, a nose as big as the beak of a bald eagle, and he's looking, and he's and he's and he's wearing a big mug, mug and dover or high necklace, and handing you a picture of a pamphlet that has a Torah scroll on it. Like, it really is a bit of a transformation here, and it breaks down the resistance because what you think of as an assimilated Jew is you're walking into something that really, really smells and feels Jewish. I must add that the people in the congregation, not all of them, but many of them, were Jewish. Very friendly, and very warm, very kind, very caring, and very sincere, and very friendly. 
makes a big, big difference. I mean, how many of people have walked into shul and ever experienced warmth and friendship and kindness and caring? Maybe here it might be one of the few exceptions in all the world, but usually there's a joke that one of the few things people will say to you if you go to shul is, excuse me, you're sitting in my seat. I mean, people don't get experience that kind of warmth and, and, and kindness. You know, I, I, I'm talking about what happened to me 30 years ago. But today, the deception and the penetration of these missionary groups is phenomenal now on the internet. Now on the internet, it is impossible not to be bombarded by these missionary groups. You go to the internet and Google any Jewish term, and you will get many results from these missionary groups. Whether you type in the words Shabbat, kosher, Torah, you name it, I won't say 50%, 80%, 30%, you will get a lot of results come up from these missionary groups. Picture, if you will, a university student coming from a secular Jewish background. He's at University of uh, Toronto or York University, and he's studying for the first time because he's got a little bit of interest in religion, comparative religions, and he's deciding to do a project on Judaism, and he's at his computer doing research, and he's ending up on all these messianic sites being and being bombarded with misinformation that basically leads him to a messianic synagogue where he gets to meet with a messianic rabbi and he asks that messianic rabbi all kinds of questions which ultimately lead to his conversion to Christianity when all he wanted to do was learn about Judaism. And it's happening all over. When I got involved with the Hebrew Christian movement, the messianic Jewish movement, the Jews for Jesus movement, whatever you want to call it, Back then, they boasted that there were 25,000 Jews worldwide involved. We're talking 1976. Today, the numbers are bursting. I'd say, conservatively, somewhere between four and 500,000 minimum. They came out with various Jewish population studies in recent years. I'm just going to give you a perspective from the United States alone. In 1990, they came out with the Jewish population study. In that study, in 1990, they came out with a number of 720,000 Jews in America that had either converted to or affiliated with a religion other than Judaism. 720,000. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the predominant religion in America is Christianity. Go forward 10 years to the year 2000. The year 2000, the Jewish population study came up with a similar study that came up with results that doubled. And then the figure was 1.4 million American Jews had either converted to or affiliated with a religion other than Judaism. I called up a recent demographer, uh, I won't name the name because it was a confidential discussion, and I called him just prior to the recent Pew Respirit. Pew report that was released. Is anybody familiar with the recent Pew report? I have it in what I have an article in our um, newsletter over there that features George Bush, by the way. Oh, a newsletter we have a picture of George Bush. The reason that he's on the cover of our newsletter because he was the keynote speaker in November at one of the largest Messianic Jewish organizations in America. He was at a fundraising dinner helping raise money the evangelical Christians who he is a member of. In that newsletter, when you read it, the Pew Report cites many horrific statistics in terms of assimilation and intermarriage. I'll just give you two, just give you two little details. 34% of American Jews have a Christmas tree in their home. And the same number, 34% of Amer American Jews have no problem with Jews believing in Jesus. That's pretty scary. Now, the demographer that I called up told me they did not publish a study this year similar to the previous one because the, the statistics were so horrific they didn't want to publish them. But the reality is if we take 1990 and we saw it was 720,000 and then the year 2000 there was 1,400,000 Jews who were converted to or affiliating with a religion other than Christianity, where do we see these numbers going? And the missionaries are taking advantage of this to a great extent. I want to discuss two other obstacles that have been taken over by these missionaries. I mentioned to you the Jewish identity clearly they've been able to overcome. When it comes to using the Jewish Bible, Jewish people, sadly, don't know the Bible. 
many of them, very few of them, are getting a Hebrew or Jewish education, and even if they do, they are not getting a strong foundation in the Tanakh. And so as a result, and I, I hate to say this, very few of them even know their names in Hebrew. I cannot tell you how often it happens when I speak to somebody that, that is coming from an assimilated background, they do not know what their Hebrew name is. And a good challenge that is interesting to do is when you find out a person, you just if you're in a position to do so, ask the person to write their Hebrew name and see how paralyzed their hands become. They can't write their name in Hebrew. So we have, we have a situation where most Jews don't understand Hebrew, and so what happens is when a missionary approaches a Jewish individual and suggests to that person that your Jewish Bible prophesies that the Messiah is going to be X, Y, and Z, they present that Jewish person with a Bible <coughs> that has a Christian translation. It is not a Jewish translation. And I'm going to give you two examples of Bible verses that I was presented with in some of the Bible studies that I went to in which I was made to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. These are very simple ones, and things get very complicated because I mean, we have 15 hours worth of lectures online refuting all the different um, passages. I'm just going to take a few moments right now to just talk about two of them. There's a passage in Psalm 22 that missionaries use, and it's very powerful. It was presented to me in one of our Bible studies to say, you know, the Bible teaches, the Jewish Bible teaches, that the Messiah would be crucified. And I went, really? I never heard of such a thing. Oh, no, really. The Jewish Bible shows that the Messiah would be crucified. And I'm shown a passage in the book of Psalms, Tehillim, chapter 22. In that particular passage, the psalmist, King David, talks about the incredible torment that he is experiencing through his enemies, the suffering. He makes references to his enemies, with the analogy of as animals, etc. And it comes to a climax in the particular passage. And this happened to me in a Bible study where the Messianic rabbi read the following and then said, th said this to me. He says, here is a passage that prophesies that the Messiah would be crucified. For Dalton, this is, comes from chapter uh, 22 of uh, Psalms, verse 17. For dogs have encompassed me, Evil doers have surrounded me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Who does that sound like the Bible speaking about? How many people are notoriously famous for having their hands and feet pierced? Sounds like Jesus. They pierced my hands and my feet. With well, a passage like that, without going into a lot of details, you see that. Wow, that's amazing. In a further Bible study, there was a passage where the Messianic rabbi was teaching a, um, a class on the book of Isaiah, the virgin birth. The predominant belief in Christianity is that Jesus was born without a father. He was born with the Ruach HaKodesh, as they would say, the Holy Spirit and a woman, no father. Where do they get this? They have a passage in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, and I'll paraphrase. For behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Okay? Wow. A virgin shall bear a son. And call. Sounds a lot like Jesus. How many people are, again, world famous for being born of a virgin? And so at, these are two passages. Without going into, again, we could spend the whole uh, hour doing these, but I'm just trying to give you a little taste of what happens in the hand of a missionary and a gullible, vulnerable Jew these passages can be very, very powerful. When you have passages like this that seem to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, all of a sudden the Jewish Bible is pointing in a direction that you never thought it would. Then comes the kicker. You know, I mentioned to you, we as a Jewish people have a personal relationship with God, but sadly, those of us who have grown up assimilated without that uh, deep and appreciative understanding of the spirituality and the beauty of Judaism, we're alien to that. We need to be introduced. These missionaries come and offer this personal relationship with God, but they say, first, you have to get right with God, and you're not right with God. Why am I not right with God? Because you've sinned, and God doesn't like sin. And then they'll, they'll cite some passages from the Bible, from their New Testament, where they'll say, 
Almost all things are by law purged with blood, because without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. But say you cannot be forgiven for your sin without a blood sacrifice. And they said, you need to have a blood sacrifice. They'll take, they'll take you to this, the temple, talk about the temple, and in the temple they'll show you, that they'll, they'll explain that the, the sacrifices were offered up on the altar, and when the temple was standing, Jews had a way of getting forgiven for their sins, but there's no temple. How are you going to be forgiven for your sins? But they'll, put, they, they'll pull the rabbit out of their hat and they'll say, God in his infinite mercy has provided a sacrifice to end all sacrifice. And that is the Messiah. He provided him after the temple was destroyed. There's no way to be, to be having your sacrifices for, uh, for uh, forgiveness of sins. You do. All you got to do is believe that Jesus died for your sins. You're going to have your sins forgiven. You're going to go to hell and have eternal life. What did I say? Go to hell. You know, I, I guess it's all subliminal. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, boo boo. Yep. Should I just rewind the take there for a minute? I think I should. So they're going to say that all you got to do is believe that Jesus died for your sins. All you got to do is believe in that. You'll be forgiven for your sins, and you go to heaven and have eternal life. The bottom line is you have these three obstacles. Number one, Jewish identity. Missionaries are able to make a Jew feel that they can be more Jewish by believing in Jesus. In fact, the Jews for Jesus organization had a billboard out there that actually said just that, be more Jewish, believe in Jesus. There was a billboard in New York that had a picture of the Rebbe, Lubavitcher Rebbe. And on that billboard it said, right idea, wrong guy. Trying to basically get people to, it's pretty powerful. They are overcoming the whole Jewish obstacle business. They get a Jewish person to um, uh, feel that the Jewish Bible is now um, having um, Bible references and Bible prophecies that prove Jesus is the Messiah. And lastly, they're told if you don't believe in this, you're going to go and hell, go to hell and burn forever. If you believe in it, you're going to go to heaven. It's very, very powerful stuff. And, and sadly, when you got the motivation of a beautiful Christian girl for a lonely Jewish guy, you know, all of a sudden, the chemistry also has part to do with it as well. It took me a year, but I got involved. And for the four, the, for the four remaining years, we're talking about five years altogether, I committed myself very strongly to this Messianic movement. I was involved as an illustrator, doing illustrations for their, their graphics, for their album covers. I was involved in radio, in TV, um, doing um, uh, a lot of public speaking for these groups. In the group that I was involved in, we uh, put together a choir, and with that choir, we would go around and uh, present songs in different Christian churches to try and motivate Christians to better evangelize Jews. We um, um, had a, a lot of outreach programs within the city, trying to invite Jewish people to come to our programming. Sadly, when we did this kind of outreach work in the city, um, my name was often mentioned in these newspaper articles because I had become the public relations director for this congregation. Fortunately, uh, the Jewish community had a council missionary activist here in Toronto whose name also appeared in many of these articles and set the record straight for the Jewish community. That was Rabbi Emmanuel Shochet. Rabbi Shochet was, uh, at the time, uh, he had been for many, many years uh, very, very well known worldwide for his ability to counter missionary claims and was extremely uh, eloquent in presenting the correct Jewish opinion on the shenanigans that missionaries uh, like our organization and others were doing in Toronto to try and convert Jews to Christianity. One of the things I did in my particular group was also teach. I had a program that I was teaching my group called Sharing Israel's Messiah with the Jewish People. It was a program where we would get together and have a class with about 15, 20 people and we'd go step by step um, through a variety of different proof texts to try and convince Jew uh, to try and help our members convince Jews to believe in Jesus. And it was an interesting program, but 
although maybe some of the uh, participants in that program may have gotten some information from me that they may not have gotten otherwise, something happened to me. You know, there's an expression that one of the best ways to learn is to teach. Um, I was given this responsibility to start teaching these classes. And at around this time, a relative gave me a Sansino Tanakh in Hebrew and English, 14 volumes, a Jewish Bible, with a correct translation. And as I started preparing my classes, um, unbeknownst to the spiritual leadership of the group that I was involved, I started making references to the Jewish Bible just to double check and see how the translations were uh, comparing from the Christian Bibles that I was working with and the original Jewish text. And um, if anybody here has ever locked into a mortgage only to have the, the mortgage rates drop the next day, you will appreciate the sick feeling you get in the stomach that I had when I started seeing some of these Bible passages that were totally contradicting what I was studying in Christianity. Passage by passage, verse by verse, I started seeing that there were some uncomfortable discrepancies between what the Christian Bible was saying and what the Jewish Bible was saying. You know, I gave you an example a few moments ago about two Bible passages that the missionaries used to try and convert Jews to Christianity. The one that proves that the Messiah had to be crucified and the other one that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. So in my studies, I saw in fact that the Bible didn't say what the Christian Bible said. In a kosher translation of the Jewish Bible, in the first example that I told you about, where the missionary says that that passage says that the Messiah would be crucified, what I learned was that first of all, there was nothing in that passage that made any reference to a Messiah. The Messiah was not the context of that passage. And so what we see is the missionaries employed one technique where they take a passage out of context. But number two, another technique they use is mistranslation. In their particular passage, the Hebrew word that they translated as pierced was ka'ari, like a, like a lion. And in the correct Hebrew translation, their verse should have translated properly into the English, for dogs have encompassed me, evil doers have surrounded me, they are at my hands and feet like a lion. That's a lot different than they pierce my hands and my feet. And it's consistent with the passage where King David talks about his enemies being like animals attacking him. When I saw this big mistranslation, I, had, I started saying, wait a minute. I had been indoctrinated by the Christian teaching that I had been learning for five years that the New Testament and the Old Testament were the inerrant word of God. There were no mistakes, no boo-boos, no mis there were just no inconsistencies. But when I found some inconsistencies, all of a sudden, like the proverbial house of cards, you remove one of those cards, everything starts come tumbling down. I started having a very shaky foundation of my faith. But I thought, you know, maybe, maybe there was uh, a reason for this. I'll, I'll keep pursuing. But when I started studying more, I saw more of these inconsistency, inconsistencies. For instance, in that passage I just cited before in terms of the virgin birth, what I discovered in the Jewish translation is that the Christian translation is a gross mistranslation. The Christian translation of, ha, and, of the word ha'alma, they translate as um, um, a virgin, but the correct translation is, should be the young woman. Also in their translation, they say, a virgin shall conceive. The Jewish translation actually says, the young woman is with child. She's already pregnant in the passage. And what I learned was that there was a, it was a huge, huge mistranslation problem here. The rule of thumb is with all these biblical proof texts that the missionaries cite, are there are always problems that can be resolved either through mistranslation, context, or circular reasoning. In some cases, for instance, there's actually verses that they cite that don't even exist. Once I started getting a lot of doubts, and I started seeing that there were some big questions here, one of the things that really uh, was a difficult thing to shake was the devil. When I converted to Christianity, one of the first things I was told 
after accepting the belief in Christianity, was that the devil would try to get me to doubt. And if I had any doubts, I should not listen to those doubts, because those doubts could not be from God. God, in his infinite mercy, had showed me that Yeshua was the Messiah. So if I'm having doubts that Yeshua is the Messiah, that God wouldn't be giving me those doubts. Those doubts have to be coming from Satan. And so as a result, many Christians might concur with this, is that often one's commitment to Christianity is not out of conviction for their belief in Jesus, but possibly out of their fear of going to hell. In my particular case, I had to deal with this indoctrination of this concept of Satan being the author of my doubts, and I eventually had to say, devil be damned, I've got to listen to my intellect. My, my Yiddish cook, my teichel, was telling me that I was making a big boo-boo, and I had to try and listen to some reason. Um, I had a friend that, when I got involved in Christianity, she got involved with Judaism. Actually, uh, she started learning downtown at Hillel with uh, Rabbi uh, David Shochet. Um, we're talking back in the 70s when he was teaching down at U of T. And, um, and I got involved with my Messianic uh, adventure. And one of the unique things about uh, Chaya was that she remained a friend. It was in spite of what I was doing. She eventually married a rabbi and um, left town, living some time in the United States, some time in Israel. But she would come back to Toronto every now and then and um, um, visit and start asking questions. Well, I just realized I, I, I missed a very important part. I, I mentioned that I was discovering some of these inconsistencies with my um, uh, uh, presenting of these uh, classes. At around this time, it's about the fifth year of my involvement with Jews for Jesus. The, I'm sorry, with the Hebrew Christians, Messianic Jews. The organization Jews for Jesus moved to Toronto about that time, and I started volunteering for them. And I was in the office of the leader of Jews for Jesus one Sunday afternoon. Um, I can't remember exactly what I was helping him out with, but we were talking in his office, and I was looking at his bookshelf, and I saw a title of a book on his shelf that... Um, caught my eye. It was called Faith Strengthened. And I pulled the book off the shelf. And as I was pulling the book off the shelf, he grabs my hand and pushes it back. This is the director of Jews for Jesus of Toronto. And I said, what are you doing? And he says, you don't want to read that book. And I said, why? And he says, it's just the kind of book that the devil would love to use for you to doubt Jesus. You don't want to read that book. Okay, so we pushed it back on the shelf was on a Sunday. The next day, Monday, I went to Negev Bookstore on Bathurst Street and spoke to the proprietor there, and I said, you have a book called Faith Strengthened? He said, sure, I have it up right here on the shelf. So I came down there, and um, I, 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 on the shelf was the book Faith Strengthened. Right beside it was another book by Arya Kaplan called The Real Messiah, and I bought that as well. Took these books home and started reading them voraciously, because what I started discovering is many of the doubts that I had been experiencing in my quest were being articulated by these writers, Ari Kaplan, Isaac Trochi, were talking about and making, and also introducing to me many other issues that I never even thought of that brought into question the validity of Christianity at all. The combination of these questions and the proofs as a house of cards starting to come down, started to make me realize that I had made a huge mistake. But still, maybe, maybe, maybe there's an answer. And I thought that I would, you know, like to speak to a rabbi, and, but I didn't. Chaya called me, and after being a friend for five years, as I mentioned, um, she would come to visit uh, Toronto and call me for a Shabbat meal, or just come to, for a glass of tea, or just for a phone call. And every time she would uh, talk to me, I would start uh, trying to convert her to Christianity, telling her about Yeshua this and Jesus that. This particular time, after my five years of uh, uh, 
uh, involvement and after this recent period of having a lot of questions and doubts, uh, she said to me, you know, what's the matter, Julius? And I said, what do you mean, what's the matter? And she said, we've been on the phone for 10 minutes and you haven't told me anything about your Messiah. What's the matter? And she was a bit of a psychologist, so she knew how to play the cards. And um, I said, well, I'm having some doubts. And she goes, really? What kind of doubts? And I tried to explain to her. And she says, well, have you spoken to a rabbi about it? And I said to her, the only rabbi that I could speak to is, uh, is Rabbi Emmanuel Shochet, but I don't think he would believe me. Because, and I explained to her how my name was in the press, and I was the bad guy, and he was the good guy. He wouldn't believe me if I called him. And she said, well, he'll believe me because I'm a good friend of his. And she arranged an appointment for me to go meet with Rabbi Shochet that night. And uh, that was the beginning of the end. We had a, an intense four-hour discussion. Um, and um, at the end of those uh, four hours, I, I said to uh, Rabbi Shochet that... Uh, I feel really guilty for what I've done. And he said, uh, and again, I, it was a lot of shenanigans for five years. He said, you should feel guilty. You've, 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 uh, you've done a bad thing. I said, so how do I fix it? And he went to explain to me the whole concept of tshuva, of repentance in Judaism. And that um, and in Judaism, the, the ideal repentance is if you've done something uh, uh, of, of a particular nature, you want to do something that will counter that as your tshuva. He said, in my particular case, if I've spent so much effort to try and convert Jews to Christianity, I should do what I can to try and undo that and stop Jews from becoming Christians and possibly even rescue them from Christianity. And when he told me that, it resonated very strongly in my, in my heart and, uh, and I had no problem in saying, you know, that's something that I think I might be interested in. Now, I didn't jump into it right away, but shortly after that, um, I was... Uh, encouraged to go to a place called Asia Torah, where I started learning about Judaism uh, and meeting uh, individuals that uh, weren't afraid about talking about God. I mean, please appreciate that coming from a secular Jewish background, if, if you talked about having a personal relationship with God or anything like that, you'd be considered a religious fanatic. But here, you know, and uh, meeting, uh, meeting up with uh, individuals uh, who were not afraid to talk about God in a spiritual way, it was encouraging for me. And through them, I got involved with learning uh, and coming to programs at uh, Orsameach, at Lubavitch, and eventually was able to realize I'd made a horrible mistake and um, uh, made a commitment from that point on to do what I can to try and counter that. It started off in 1982 as just a little bit of activi activism, um, but in 1989, I formally uh, took on the responsibility of uh, running Jews for Judaism here in Canada. And so it's been 24 years since that happened. And um, as they say, the rest is history. I have a few more thoughts that I'd like to share, but I thought what we'll do is put on the video, and then I'll just share a few more thoughts in terms, and then we'll wrap up with some questions, okay? Sorry, the, the video is a little bit dated. My apologies for that, but what you should have seen in this video are a couple things. That this is not just a young people's problem. We see children, we see boobies and zadies, and there is no limit to the uh, type of individual that is susceptible to the um, efforts of these missionaries. The only common denominator that all these Jews have is a shallow and limited Jewish upbringing in terms of what Judaism is all about for them. And so what we see from this, and, I, and again, the problem is much worse. If, I, if you go on, I don't want, to, want you to go online, but online exists so much more video footage that really we have a project to just put together uh, some of the uh, clips from some of these uh, missionary groups to see the extent to which they're going, that so many of them now are far beyond this. They have a, a lot of the leaders in this group, the rabbis wear a black hat and a kapota, you would think they were a Lubavitcher rabbi, um, and, and, and their synagogues are huge with thousands and thousands of members, some of them. It is getting very, very big. What I'd like to do is uh, take a few of your questions. I have a few more points that I'd like to uh, close with, but I thought maybe your questions 
might be exactly the very points that I want to talk about. Yes? I have a question. When you say rabbis, what's a Masonic rabbi? Are these actual, did, did they, do they have the regular smichon? They have smichon, like what I'm saying, like do they have I said, so what is the, the question is what is a messianic rabbi? Or, or what when you say, like you're saying that they're calling themselves. They're calling themselves. They're These calling, are, they're not, they let's have, call they a spade, let, the other way? let's call a spade a spade. Messianic rabbis, okay, the, the word I probably didn't use in this whole discussion was deception. Deception is used in, they don't think it's deception, but it's deception. Okay. They are altering every possible term to make you feel that what you are encountering is legitimately Jewish. So when I was involved in this movement back from 1976 to 81, then they referred to their spiritual leaders as Messianic rabbis. Today, today they've dropped the term Messianic and they just call them rabbis. They, they don't feel they have to apologize to nobody. The reality is when they put in the word messianic, it was synonymous with Christian. Their ordination comes from institutions that have their roots in evangelical Protestant Christianity. There is absolutely nothing Jewish about any of them. All their ordinations come and it can be traced to evangelical Protestant Christian organizations or Bible colleges. Are these men Jewish? Most of the individuals today who are involved are Jewish. In the early days when I got involved, many were not. Um, so, for instance, there are people on screen who I know from my personal experience, according to the halachic definition of Jewish, being do they have a Jewish mother, I know that individuals in the movement do not have Jewish mothers, therefore they're not Jewish. You shouldn't be shocked because we have, to give you an idea of the scope that we're dealing with, I mentioned to you when I joined the movement, it was 25,000. Now today we see that uh, without batting an eyelash, the numbers of Jews who were involved in Christianity far exceed half a million. When I was in the movement, there were 11 Messianic synagogues in North America. Now there are 600 Messianic synagogues in North America, about 100 in the former Soviet Union, 150 in Israel, and other places around the world. The movement is definitely growing. Yes? Once you recognize, obviously, that uh, you were heading in the wrong direction, and you pretty well uh, came to the understanding um, that Judaism it is the path. Uh, how did you come about to your fellow uh, colleague or or church member, if you want, uh, you would say, and, and what was the reaction? So when I um, met with Rabbi Shochet, Rabbi Shochet gave me uh, some advice, and one piece of advice that was he said was extremely important that I follow religiously, if you want to use that term, was that I should have no emotional contact whatsoever with these people. He said because, any contact whatsoever, because they will be able to, depending, he didn't know how strength strong I was and how um, firm I was in my convictions, and on an emotional level, these people could pull you, pull you back. So he was of the opinion that I should not have any contact with them whatsoever. So I had limited contact, what I did do when I came out, I started getting, and some of the people who I was involved with as, as an illustrator, I just wanted to mention to you as an illustrator, when I finally came out, I started using my, I was a famous illustrator in Canada, uh, doing work for magazines like Maclean's, Toronto Life, Canadian Business. When I finally came out of Christianity, I started doing work for kosher organizations. Some, some of you may have seen this. Have, you, have anybody, this familiar to anybody? Yeah, so I did that illustration. I did a lot of, at one point they called me the Jewish Norman Rockwell. Um, I have my own website, juliasis.com, if you want to take a look at some more of my other stuff. But um, um, my, my point is that um, it, it was very difficult for me to, I don't know how I got sidetracked on that. Um, oh yeah, I got calls from many of the individuals that I had worked for in North America. I must have worked for at least 10 different well-known evangelical missionary organizations, uh, including uh, Jews for Jesus and uh, famous evangelical uh, Rachmil Friedland, uh, Jewish Voice, and different groups, um, helping them in various aspects, logo design, illustration, graphic <coughs> design. And many of the leaders within the movement had also been um, 
uh, friends with me. And so when I, they heard that I dropped out, I started getting calls from these individuals to come meet with them. And, and, and heeding uh, Rabbi Shrokin's advice, I said no. And my attitude was no, because I'd given them five years of my life. It's enough. Oh, another, another uh, challenge that Rabbi Shrokin gave me. He said, you know, you've just wasted five years of your life embracing Christianity, trying to convince Jews to become part of it, and now you yourself are realizing you made a mistake. Why don't you give yourself five months of your life and start learning about Judaism? At least check it out. Find out what it is that you didn't know. Get a taste for it. After, you know, once you've made a, a, a serious attempt at trying to learn something about Judaism, you know, I can't stop you from being a Christian, but at least you'll have an idea of what it is that you're, you're saying is the fulfillment of Judaism, but you know nothing about it. And he was right. I was, you know, if you were engaging, bringing Jews into Christianity, would you see the need to bring those Jews that you were associated oh, with? Oh, so that's your question. So, yes, yes. So, th th I did make an attempt to try and speak to some of them, and many of them um, would not speak to me. I did have um, one successful uh, encounter with one of these people, bringing them back, and uh, got the woman to, it got to the point where she was agreed to throw out all her books and everything. Um, but most of them would not speak to me because you have to understand from a theological perspective in Christianity, if you're for God, uh, if you, if you, I'm sorry, if, if you believe in God and God shows you that Jesus is Messiah, this is, this is very primitive when you take a look how this is perceived. But if, 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 if you believe in Jesus, that he's Messiah, then you believe in God. If something comes to show you that Jesus is not the Messiah, that's not from God. And therefore, I overnight became an agent of Satan. So to talk to Julius was to talk to the devil. We actually had um, somebody speak on December 24th. If you could just turn to the back of that newsletter there, you see the, the flames there. Ira Michaels came to Toronto to speak. He was a messianic leader, a messianic rabbi of his own congregation for 20 years. He, he was eventually able to understand and, and realize the mistake of what he had made and through slow work, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not like just showing somebody on a dotted line a little boo-boo. You know, when people have their own convictions on the line, their own egos on the line, that they've they put their entire lives on the line, they're married into the industry, they've got kids in the business, and they have a congregation. It's not so easy to just convince somebody overnight. But this fellow, Ira Michelson, came to the conclusion after 20 years that he made a big boo-boo and he was so able to come up. So being shocked, well shocked. Like I, 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 didn't, I, I knew it existed, but I didn't know in what capacity, the numbers that you mentioned. This is catastrophe. This is, this is Holocaust. We have 20,000, it's a so, small number in Israel, 20,000. So what are the Orthodox leaders, the influential big, big rabbis in the world are planning to do about it? This so, it's a great question. I'm going to answer your question with a story, okay? I had the exact same question happen a few years ago. I was speaking in London, London, Ontario, and spoke to a, a, a group there, and a woman in the audience came up, stood up, and she says, this was the answer, she says, what are the, this is terrible, this is a catastrophe, what are the rabbis doing about this? And what is Federation doing about this? And what is Canadian Jewish Congress doing about this? And what are the Jewish day schools doing about this? And, 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 and on, 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 on. And I said to her, I said, lady, you have to understand, they can't do anything about this. The only way we're going to do anything about this is if you understand and appreciate why and how the missionaries are affected. The missionaries are effective ultimately not because of organizations like Jews for Jesus and City of David and Mount Israel. They're not successful because of them. They are successful because of the individual people who embrace this faith and take it upon themselves to reach out to other people on a one-on-one -on -one basis and share and show the love and care, and they invite the people to the service, and they invite the people to their home, and they invite the people to their events. If we have, I hate to say this, we have to actually back up a little and follow their example, because the, the, the rabbis are busy running synagogues, they're doing their programs, they're doing their education. The rabbis brought me in here to do this, to alert you of this spiritual holocaust that's happening. But the remedy, the remedy to this problem can be understood 
in terms of the name our organization. We did not name our organization Jews Against Missionaries or Jews Against Jesus. We named our organization Jews for Judaism. So if I could just take a little break here. Oh, I have it right here. I have a flyer there in my back panel there. But, you know, when, when we're dealing with the whole issue of how do we fight this problem, we, we, we produced a little ad that we publish um, once in a while to try and be soft sell in terms of uh, what we could do to remedy this problem. You can see this little flyer here. We have it on the back. Missionaries are trying to convert Jews to Christianity. And you're asking what we can do about fighting it. So the answer is to fight the missionaries is not to take a counter missionary course. It's not to go study all these verses. It's not to go and, although we could appreciate the nations for Jews for Judaism, don't get me wrong, the answer is <coughs> say yes to Judaism. That is the answer. If every Jew said yes to Judaism, every Jew who is committed to Judaism takes it just a little bit more seriously. We can wipe the missionary problem off the face of the earth. What do we say here? This week and every week, make your Jewish practice stronger and more meaningful. Study Torah and learn more about Judaism. Light Shabbat candles. And I'm speaking to a secular crowd. I mean, you're obviously here, you're affiliated, you're committed to a certain extent. I'm speaking to people who are not so committed. Light Shabbat candles and bless your children. Have a Shabbat meal. Enjoy it with family and friends. Give tzedakah. Generously help those in need. Do tikkun olam. Try your best to make the world a better place. Pray to the God of all humanity and connect with a synagogue. And for every step you take, invite somebody to join you. We want to share. We want to get involved. We want to do, you know, we, 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 I don't know about you, but my experience coming back into Judaism, I felt like a Nazi coming into a Jewish environment. I was the public enemy number one. You have no idea what it is like to be hated by the Jewish community. And that's, I was. I was hated by the Jewish community. I remember the first time I walked into, um, into a shul to try and um, start dominating on Shabbos, people were pointing their fingers at me. That's, that's him. That's him. And I can't blame them I, because I was notorious. I wasn't shy when I was a missionary. My pictures were in the paper and I was I, taking interviews, but I was an enemy. You know, I, one, one student group here, there was a Jewish student group I was sitting at a Pesach Seder, uh, Pesach Seder table uh, two years after I came out of Christianity um, and I was feeling really comfortable with this group around the table. At the table, I, I can't name the names of the people or the organization, I just want to keep it confidential, but these were student activists. And I said something at the table about how great it is to be with you guys that you finally accepted me. And one of the leaders of the activist organization said, what makes you think we accept you? We don't trust you. And one of them admitted that they, had, that they, that, that they were discussing ways to kill me. That's a terrible thing to say. They said, should we kill sis for what I was doing? A terrible thing. But you know what? When you have that, but, but I'm saying, so I'm coming into the, um, um, the, Jewish, the Jewish community. I was a very, very, very much hated individual. And the acceptance I received and the warmth and the kindness and the, and the openness from the different rabbis and the individual was amazing. Even though some members pointed the fingers, you know, I, it took a little bit of guts, but it was the love and the care and the concern of individuals that made my experience and my reintegration into the Jewish community something that was very meaningful. And one of the things that was really helpful was coming to somebody's home for Shabbat. To be at a Shabbat table and to be able to just learn about some of the customs of Shabbat and the halachas and to get a Dvar Torah from the, the host or the rabbi Amazing. We have to start doing that. The missionaries do not hesitate one bit to reach out and invite everybody they can. We have to stop being so insular, and even if it's just a little bit, let's say, you know, I'm not saying that every moment of every day you have to go out and try doing outreach. Okay, once a week, once a month, do something to say, this week, once a month, we're going to make a Shabbat table, and we're going to invite guests to our house for Shabbat, and we're going to make a Dvar Torah and have a light, nice discussion. We're going to sing a couple's mirrors and make Shabbat a meaningful experience, not only for us, but for our guests. That's a big challenge. But you know what? It's something that would help you and help your friends as well. 
That's a long answer to a short question. More questions? Yes? Uh, as a second generation from vocal survivors, how did your family took you? That's Good question. question. Number one, and the second, how do we, because it's so open, how do we protect our children? So it's a difficult thing. Number one, how did my, when my father found out about what I was doing, it was after I had had a huge event here in Toronto that was um, the catalyst for one of the biggest Jewish protests for a missionary organization in Toronto's history. This was 1980, it was at Northview Heights Secondary School, and this singing group that you saw singing in St. Petersburg, I had brought them to Toronto to sing at Northview Heights Secondary School. I had put posters all over the city of them with Hasidic dancers. I had made such a deceptive advertising campaign. Um, we had, it was a huge, huge audience, but there were a lot of protests out there. And um, when, I, when I had um, experienced the um, um, passion and the fervor of all these members of the Jewish community that were so convinced that we were wrong, it did something to my kishkas. Something inside me snapped and I went, wait a minute, is it possible that maybe I could be wrong? Maybe that they know something I don't know. Where are they getting all their passion to make a statement? And it was, I'm making that as an aside because the, the influence of, of individuals, um, I'm, I'm forgetting your two questions. The first question was? How did your family? Okay, so after that incident, after that incident, it was in the newspapers. And it was the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, Canadian Jewish News, everywhere. And I mentioned to you that um, I was a very, very well-known illustrator. It was not unusual for me to have a cover of McLean's Magazine one week, Toronto Life next week, Canadian Business Magazine next week, Toronto Star next I was all over the place in terms of my illustrations. So my father, who worked on Spadina, on a sewing machine, he would come to the office and whenever he would have a picture to show up what I did, he would bring it to the office and show all his uh, colleagues. He was my son, look what he did. So this Monday he comes, he comes to work, uh, but Monday, yeah, and uh, not knowing what I had been involved in, because I never told my parents what I was doing, his friends, and they're all Holocaust survivors, showed him the newspaper with, with your son, Sis, the missionary, Toronto Sun, Globe and Mail, and Sadly, that, that night, we were supposed to have a birthday party for my father at the house, at, our, at his home. So I never told him anything about the newspaper articles, and I just assumed he never saw it. When I came to the house, we came for the birthday party, I brought the cake from Hermes, coming in through the front door, and he said to me, you leave, you're not my son anymore. What do you do? And there with the birthday cake. But my father meant it. I mean, I, it was, he was of the old school. There was no middle ground here. I crossed the line. You are not my son anymore. And um, and uh, I had kept it a secret, but by because I, I just didn't know how to deal with it. But once the cat was out of the bag, um, we had some very tense and difficult family discussions that um, basically ostracized me for a great extent to a great extent in my family. And the opposite was the case when I finally came back and started doing my tshuva, um, the doors were wide open. Your second question was? How do we protect our children? Because we live in a society, you know, universities, colleges. Exactly. You yeah. know what? The, the, the remedy is, you know, you cannot, you cannot be following your children where they go. I have, I have an 18-year-old daughter. She's going to be 18 in two months. I'm faced with the same dilemma. I'm sending her to a day school. She goes to, to Ferris Base Yaakov. She goes to a Jewish girl, uh, school for girls. You know, but I see what happens. It's, you, there's no guarantees. But you have to do the best you can, number one, to raise your children with the best Jewish values that you can. One of the things I have learned, <coughs> though, is that there is a misconception, I feel, this is my opinion, I'm not going to say this is the rabbi's opinion, it's my opinion, there's a misconception that Judaism is something that we can just pass on to our children like a football. I'll, I'll give you an analogy of what I mean with the following. When you go on an airplane, uh, and they start with the announcements before you, when you're doing the seatbelts, and they tell you, in an emergency, 
with the oxygen mask. They say first you put the oxygen on yourself, then you put it on your child. So it is with Judaism. We cannot expect to save our child if we don't save ourselves first. So as much, as much as you want to protect your children and do what you can, until you embrace the Judaism you want them to have a commitment to, they're just going to think it's hypocrisy. They're, 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 they're not going to take it seriously. They've got to see that mommy and daddy really love, or Booby and Zadie are really committed to Judaism before they take it seriously. They're not going to take it seriously. It's, it's, uh, I know that it was my dilemma when I went to Cheder. Here I went to Cheder, we were learning about Shabbat and Kashrut, when we came home, it didn't exist. You know, it's a double standard. When we go to, we would go to, we go to restaurants and they weren't kosher. I mean, like, what's going on here? So, uh, I'm not telling you what you should do, you, but I am answering the question, how do we ensure that our children will be um, able to survive what's coming up in terms of what they're faced with as they enter adults? I'll give you another story. You had Rabbi Skobek speaking here for Shabbos. I don't know if he told the story, but um, he, we have a book that he wrote there called Intermarriage. And in his book on intermarriage, he writes uh, about an encounter he had um, at the University of Windsor a number of years ago with a group of law students. He was brought in there to um, uh, teach a class on the missionary problem. And about 15 minutes into the missionary problem, the university's uh, one of the students said, I have a question. And, and so she, the question she had was, um, he said, oh, he says, you know, we're really not interested in hearing you talk anymore about missionaries. We want you to talk about why we can't marry a Gentile. <laughs> that was the question. Yeah, we're not answering it. Why can't I marry a Gentile? And so the rabbi, and you'll have to read how he writes about it in the book. He says, you know what? He says, I appreciate you all. You don't want me to hear about me talking about the missionary problem. I'm very happy to abandon that and talk about uh, any valid question you have. But I don't think you're asking me a valid question. And the student says, what is that valid question? Why is it a valid question? Why shouldn't I marry a Gentile? He says, because it's the wrong question. I'll answer the right question. And she says, what's the right question? She says, the question you should be asking is, why should I be Jewish? Why should I be Jewish if you're a Jew? And that is the question. Jews today don't know why they should be Jewish. And if you can inculcate into that individual the importance of being Jewish, the, it's, it's, the, that it's not just a hobby, it's not just the flavor of the month. We have a legacy of a Torah that we received at Mount Sinai. We're just reading about it in the Parsha this week. We just read about the splitting of the Red Sea. Is that, is that a wives' tale? Is that, is that a myth? Or did that really happen? And if these things really happen, then we have, a, we have a big problem because most of our children don't know about it or don't believe it. We have to have a Jewish, uh, we have to have Jewish children and grandchildren that know why we're Jewish. They can be able to articulate to somebody who challenges them, why should I be Jewish? And people don't know. It's a big issue. But they imitate Jewishness. They were the keepers, they were the... They call themselves the rabbi, they... Who's they? Who's they? Your children? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Forget about what you saw on the screen. Your question the is screen. about your children. We're talking about your children. <coughs> You're asking how do we protect our children and our... If, if, here's the thing. I'll give you another story from Rabbi Skobek, okay? Rabbi Skobek gives a story about how they train people in the... I forget the department that it's called the United States where they, tra where they, where they track counterfeit money. Okay, in the United States government, they have a special agency tracking counterfeit money. And so you would think that the way that they would train the officials who were involved in counterfeit money was to show them all the different ways they can make counterfeit money and all the different angles of this. No, they don't do that. The way they train, they use, the, 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 they use real money. They get people to train in their real production of money and they know how to make the plates, they know how to make the engravings. And when people know the real thing, you can spot a counterfeit a mile away. When Jews know what true Judaism is, they will smell a rat, no problem. But as long as Jews are not connected Jewishly, 
they're going to be victim. They're going to be vulnerable. They're going to be susceptible. It's, it's, we, we, I'm not saying we don't do our best when we're speaking at a university group and I'm speaking to the very people you're talking about, those 18, 19, 20 year olds who are in their first, second year of university and they're asking the same question. I'm not telling them that the answer I'm telling you. I'm telling them in different ways. I gotta let them know we have to appreciate what is true and what is not. This is deception. How do we understand what is real Judaism? What is a real rabbi? Here they are using these titles to fool you, to deceive you, to mislead you, to lure you, to trap you, to make you think that it's safe when it's not, to make you think that it's Jewish when it's Christian, to make you think that it's good when it's not. We have to give that explanation to these, but I'm speaking to you as a booby or a parent. A booby too. And by the way, I got a booby rule. You are not exempt from teaching your grandchildren. You know, the Torah teaches we should teach our children and our children's children. You can't stop being a booby. You know, you're a parent for your, your children, but you, you have a benefit and an incredible influence on your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. So I had, I, you know, I, I, and I've seen this. You know, the rabbi must see this all the time. And, and we have a phenomenal, uh, uh, an amazing phenomenon that is happening in the Jewish world in the last 20 years called the Baal Tshuva movement. And most people think that it's a movement amongst young Jews who are coming back to Yiddishkeit. But what they don't realize, it's not true. It's a movement of Jews coming back to Yiddishkeit. We have young Jews and we have old Jews, boobies and zadies. And we see that those boobies and zadies, when they grasp the beauty and the depth and the spirituality of Judaism, there's no holding back the influence they can have on their peers, on their children, and on their grandchildren. They don't have to try because people are drawn to it as Jews. But so the whole, the whole idea of, of um, having an influence is something, it gets, it gets back to that little poster I just showed you. Missionaries are successful because they are each personal emissaries. And with your question, was it your question about what are the rabbis doing? The rabbis are trying their best, and some of them better than others. But what are we doing? And that's that is the problem. We can't. The buck stops here. If you're not capable, if you're not capable, if you're not willing to do just a little bit more, it's it's a hard thing. It's a very hard thing because we get comfortable. We get very. Rabbi, you must experience this all the time, but you have to be sensitive because you're dealing with, you know, situations where you maybe have to be a little bit more firm in your advice. But the reality is. I'm a guest, I can say whatever I want, you can't, but I'm telling it like it is, that if you really want to have an impact on individuals, you're gonna to have to try a little harder, reach out a little bit more, and actually admit, you know, you have to take an inventory of your own Jewish life and say, what can I improve? Almost like a New Year's resolution list, but a little bit different, the tshuva list. You know, we're not all perfect, and oh, I'm gonna give you another, I love these little stories. I once gave a little lecture, uh, on Rosh Hashanah at a, an alter, alternative uh, uh, high holiday service. And at, the, at this particular alternative high holiday service, um, one of the individuals was talking about, uh, you know, my, my, my message was ultimately we've got to try and uh, make a stronger commitment to Judaism. And he stood up, you know, with an attitude, says, well, Julius, you know, I can't keep Shabbos. And I said, why? Well, because I work on Saturday, and I, I, I just, I can't quit my job. I said, so you're trying to tell me, because you work on Saturday, you can't keep job. He says, yeah, so what am I supposed to do? And I said, do you work on Friday night? He said, no. I said, so why can't you keep job Friday night? And he said, you mean I can do that? It's just like a whole light bulb went off. I'm not saying work on Shabbos on Saturday, but I'm saying do the best you can. If you can keep Shabbos Friday night, that's something. If you can say a Kiddush on Friday night and show your kids what, what a Kiddush is and, and a Devar Torah and, and come to shul and you know, I'm, I'm not crazy about you going to work on Saturday, but just Friday night. And story, a year later, he's not working on Saturday anymore because he found out about the beauty of a Shabbos and he realized what priorities are. Work was not that important. He could give it up one day a week. But you know what, I, I, was, I, I couldn't tell him, but, what, but the bell, the light went off when he realized it's not all or nothing. 
Judaism is little increments here and there. You do what you can. You know what? When I started keeping kosher, I switched from a Hungarian restaurant was serving pork, <laughs> and I went to a vegetarian restaurant downtown. It was a transition, very slow. I'm not saying that's the way to do it, but for me, I stopped eating in the pork restaurant and I went to a vegetarian restaurant. Is it perfect? Okay. But that was my step, and it was an increment. So, then I started going, I started going to a kosher restaurant. As a singer, I was a bachelor then. But it's an increment. You know, somebody else, they're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to learn. To, it reminds me of, of the first time I learned to do, do the bir hatamazon after a meal. I don't know about some of you, but it's torture. If you've never done it, you don't know how to do it. Oh my gosh, it's like breaking your teeth. But you know, I remember once I was sitting at a, at a, at a conference with um, two other rabbis at the table, and we were having breakfast. And we we're about to come to Birchat Mazon. And the only way I knew how to do it was to sing it. Because I did, you know, I, I just couldn't do the, the benching without the melody. <laughs> so uh, the two rabbis were there. We had a, we had a Mazuman. We we're going to bench a Mazuman. And I said, but you know, the only way I know how to do it is sing it. Do you mind if we sing it? And I said, I'm sort of very busy. We haven't got time to sing it. They were in a hurry. And I had to solely sit there by myself after we did the initial benediction to do it by myself, breaking my teeth. And learning how to do the davening, the Shmona Esrei. Oh my gosh, is it hard. But you know, once you finally just overcome that little leap, just to take on a little extra and accomplish, but you feel like you, you've gone someplace. Nobody gets there overnight, and everything is, is going to be in a little increment, but we can do whatever we can do to be a Jew for Judaism that gives us the opportunity to do what we can to help change the Jewish world.